Hey world, welcome to another edition of Tandem Tactics. I am Dan Brown here with Tao and Garrett. And we're gonna play another game of magic as as we do. You know what? Let's roll for priority right now. Rather than at the end, and then we can talk about our decks sure. in turn order. That is a that is a five. No, it's not. We do a low roll? What's that? A 14? 14. 14. Okay. Tau. 13? 13, oh, well, yeah, yeah. Still lost. <laughs> Tau! What are you playing, Tau? I am playing Teferi. Temporal Archmage. His main ability is a uh, minus one. I get to untap four permanents. The main combo is uh, he goes infinite in a variety of combinations with the Chain Veil. Other than the combo, I play a lot of clone effects. J j just because you assume there's going to be something good on the board, even if it's an opponent's thing that you can just take advantage of? Yeah, it's a it's a good way to play a control role and not like a full all-in combo role because I figure if I'm cloning what my opponents have, at least that should give us board parity. But so it's not like a permission control sort of thing, because like bl blue is very good at, you know, kind of prototypical control. When, when you say it lets you play more of a control role, I guess I'm not quite sure what you mean. Like it lets you play to the board. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I, I run maybe like four or five different co counter spells. My, my goal isn't to like counter everyone out of the game or right. anything like that. Blue has traditionally a hard time dealing with permanents on the board. Gotcha. And cloning things is kind of a good way to kind of match my opponents. Understood. My commander is the Mimeoplasm, um, and I pl I'm playing him as a, a bug combo control type general. Puts lots of cards in the graveyard, um, and then hopes to combo out with uh, my secret general, the Necrotic Ooze. Triskillian and uh, Phyrexian Devourer, which is the most common one, uh, but then I can also, once I have plus one plus one counters, I can uh, take them off in a bunch of different ways. And the deck that I'm playing um, is a, a retooled version of a Chromat deck that I have featured here before. Actually, by the time this publishes, I will have my deck tech published for it. The way I describe it in a sentence is Chromat mono green with a blue sub theme with. Azusa as a secret commander lands. Splash. <laughs> Splash the other colors. Yeah, yeah. Splashing white, black, right, right. right. So um, I run 47 lands in the entire deck, and the, the idea is to try to play multiple lands per turn somehow. Azusa is the best way to do it, but also Exploration, Oracle of Moldiah, um, and build a huge mana advantage quickly is, is you know, the, the general idea. I have a few win conditions, like shoehorned in. I'm still trying to figure <laughs> out maybe the best way to uh, close things out, but Debt to the Deathless can do it, or a Kessig Wolf Run on Chromat can do it. I'm really proud of the deck. I think it's pretty unique. I mean, I've, I've, I've always said this about my Chromat builds, but this is less combo-centric than it has been in the past, because without the partial Paris Mulligan, it's really hard to have an all-in combo deck that's also five colors, because, you know, I, I relied on the partial Paris very heavily to fix my mana and hold on to combo pieces. Right, let's, play, let's play magic! Let's do All it! Right. Magic! I tossed my initial seven, because I only had one land, and I kept the second seven. It had three islands, a Lotus Veil, vale, a Vesuvian Doppelganger, a Phyrexian Metamorph, and a Mystic Confluence. So, all in all, a very slow hand, but I didn't want to risk having any fewer lands in a six-card hand, so felt it was good enough. My opening hand was Necrotic Ooze, uh, Sage of Hours, um, Liliana, uh, the three drop one. Um, right, the, the, yeah, good the, one. the good one. <laughs> um, Beast Within, uh, Bayou, Lonely Sandbar, and Thought Scour. Could have been a lot better, but... Um, what would have made it better? Um, honestly, I, I don't like having the combo pieces like Necrotic Ooze in my opening hand really right. isn't good. I'm going to get that later. I'm going to mill into it, so maybe some type of dredger or something. Um, uh, more mill, mill cards for myself would have been nice. Yeah, um, like you, you never really want the finisher in exactly. the opening hand, much less if it's a finisher from the graveyard. Like It's, it's in right. the wrong zone to begin with. Exactly. Right? Um, but I had the I had the Liliana, so I could discard the pieces when I, ha when I got to um, there. I didn't have the two black sources um, to cast her, but... Um, I figured I'd draw those. Uh, this was my second opening hand, so my first one had no lands in it at all. Right. So I didn't want to go to six, because then I'm even further away from discarding cards. That I makes sense. Yeah, in a, in a graveyard deck, I guess yes. that makes a lot of sense. My opening hand was a Halimar Depths, a Temple of Enlightenment, an Overgrown Tomb, a Voyaging Seder, a Verdant Haven, a Clever Impersonator, and a Dark Petition. So I, I, I like the hand a lot, because I have, uh, you know, three lands, that two of which filter the top of my library, and the Hal Halimar Depths and Temple actually synergize very well because I can Halimar Depths first and then scry away something I don't want. So right. we're really filtering pretty fast. Plus we have 2-drop, 3-drop, 4-drop, 5-drop. Um, so we're on curve. The only thing this hand is missing is a way to play multiple land drops 
every turn. But I figured that I could hit something. With, I mean, the Dark Petition was going to get me there mm -hmm. um, regardless. And I knew I was going to be ramping pretty extremely, extremely with the Voyaging Seder plus Verdant Haven ramp that plays off of each other, you know what I mean? The Voyaging right, Seder, right. untapping a land that is tapping for extra because of the Verdant Haven is like, it's like three ramp spells for the price of two, really. And something I hadn't thought about before, but the un the land untappers oh, automatically yeah. give you double of whatever. Usually when you're building a five-color deck, you're trying to, you're really careful about double and triple mana costs. Right. Yeah, I, 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 I built this deck around Future Sight, right? Which is blue, <laughs> right. blue, blue in its cost. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but and then you also have debt of the debtless, right? Two black, two white. <laughs> well, that's got... a finisher. By the yeah. time we're at that point, we want to have like fifty lands in play anyway. So. Right. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like you have like these like, super mana intensive hands, right? You, but you don't worry about it. I, I would say on a scale of one to ten, this hand was an eight. Um, it, it's a really strong hand. All, all we were missing was you know exploration. Turn one, I draw Sensei's divining top, and I'm simultaneously fist pumping and ready to apologize for how long this game is going to take <laughs> because mm -hmm. I'm fist pumping because now I have things to do on every single turn. I'm not just stuck with like four and five drops in my hand. Uh, I just play an island in the top and I think I do say something like, I'll try to be fast with my top decisions. <laughs> and then proceeds to type every single top decision out. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's like the best turn one draw pretty much. Yeah. You know, maybe Soul Ring, but like... For, 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 for top 10 turn one draws, Sensei's Divining Top is certainly... Yeah, that took the hand from a 6 or a 7 to an 8 or a 9. Oh, yeah. Right away. And my turn one, I drew a forest, um, so I played the Lonely Sandbar because I knew I wanted a blue source yeah. um, to use my use for my Thought Scour. My turn one, I drew a Bloodstained Mire, and then I played the Halimar Depths, and that revealed the Magus of the Future, Time Spiral, and an Island. And I put them back in that order because I knew I had enough land drops in my hand already. was very glad to see both of those cards. Uh, those are both instrumental to the deck. Turn two, uh, I won't go into all of my top decisions. Basically, I was just rearranging cards to make sure I had a good curve. So right. the, the, the audience can just assume that you were filtering your draws and that they were pretty right. decent. <laughs> so this turn I got a Pesaju who shelters all. Uh, really nice because I could play a tapped and still top and that was my turn. My turn two, I drew a Tropical Island, um, but I played the Bayou because I knew I wanted double black for that Liliana. Yeah. Um, and then I played the Thought Scour, and I actually got rid of a, um, a Swamp in that, which was kind of depressing, and I drew a Nith Nithalia Drownyard. Turn two, I drew the Magus of the Future that I knew was there, then I played an Overgrown Tomb, and I took the Shock, and I cast a Voyaging Seder. You know, we're on curve, we're getting our man dorks out there. Or we're ahead of the curve, really. We're, we're about to be ahead of the curve next turn, right? <laughs> so my turn three, I end up drawing an Arcane Denial, and uh, I thought a moment about just playing the Fire Exing Metamorph to copy the Voyaging Seder. I decided, nah, it's not a high impact enough uh, play at this point. I just decided I'll leave up the Arcane Denial, uh, even though I don't expect to actually counter anything this early in the game. So yeah. I played an island that passed. Although you, I mean, you run so many lands that tap, or I guess not a ton of lands that tap for multiple, but you had the what Lotus Bloom in your hand already. I right? had Lotus Veil Lotus in my Veil. hand already. Um, I wanted one more turn to go by before I see what what I copied. Right. So, it, was, so. it was definitely a more conservative play to wait, see what we cast, because we were getting to the points in our games where we might start dropping right. you know more beefy things to target or. I guess not target, but to enter as with the metamorph. My turn three, um, I once again missed the black source. I uh, drew a bit of progress, um, and so I played my tropical island, um, working towards the Nefalia Drownyard. I got the turn before. How much does Nefalia Dr Drownyard cost to activate? Uh, three mana. Okay, a, a blue, right. a black, and a colorless. Cool. And then it tapping itself. So right, I right. couldn't use it that turn anyway. On my turn uh, three, I drew the time spiral, again, that I knew that was there, and I played uh, my Temple of Enlightenment, and I did a no-look scry. I remember that there was an island right <laughs> on top, so I didn't look at it. So I, uh, I assumed that it didn't, you know, uh, exist in a state of quantum superposition and change, because it had already been observed, right? You know, I, be I believe very strongly that the cards that go unobserved are in a state of sure, you know, flux, sure. right? right? You also feel really badass doing it. It's like sometimes yeah. <laughs> you crack a fetch and you just take the top card of your library oh, yeah. and put it on the battlefield because you know where But you still have want. to shuffle, technically. And you still have to shuffle, yeah. But. <laughs> Unless you're in a casual game and opponents don't really care. But Then I uh, cast Verdant Haven <laughs> on the Halimar Depths, uh, which regained me the two life that I had lost from the Shockland. So I lost two life the turn before, but then I regained the two life. It was, it was 40 life. Life is good. Life is, life is good. And the life yeah. total was good, too. My turn four, uh, well, at the end of Dan's turn, I topped and found that Phantasmal Image. So at this point, I'm thinking, okay, now it's worth it to copy the Voyaging Seder because I can play an island. 
I play the Phantasmal image to copy the Voyaging Seder. I'm holding the Lotus Veil in my hand, so next turn I get you know six mana out of it. It's gross. And I get to keep up the Arcane Denial just in case something fishy happens. You're doing the thing that my deck does better than my deck <laughs> by piggybacking the things in my deck. That's that's what you get when you play clones. So. Well, but plus the the Lotus, whatever you know. That, that's like both our decks revolve around this untapping theme, right? With lands or permanence that produce multiple mana. It was nice. I mean, I probably would play Voyaging Seder if there was a blue version of it, and in this game, there was. Yeah, Fate Stitcher, right? Fate Stitcher is in the deck, yeah. Okay, all right. Then it was my turn for, um, I still missed the Black Source, so I drew a Fr uh, Phyrexian Devourer, which is great for me because uh, Phyrexian Devourer is part of the combo. Now I have an entire combo in my hand. The Necrotic Ooze, uh, which copies the abilities through the graveyard. Right. Phyrexian Devourer would put plus one, plus one counters on it by exiling cards off the top of my library. And then I also have the um, Sage of Hours to remove plus one, plus one counters to give me infinite, er, not infinite, but nearly infinite extra turns. Still can't cast Necrotic Ooze, don't have double black. Still can't cast Liliana, don't have double black. But um, I played the Drown Yard, and I can start milling myself a little bit. Um, and then it passed to you, Dan. So on my turn four, um, I drew a Boros Garrison. This is the first draw that I didn't know from the uh, Halimar <laughs> Depths. And it's a good thing to see, you know, we always like bounce lands in this deck, particularly with the Voyaging Seder. Although it made me wish a little bit that I might have held off on the Verdant Haven, because you know, we like to put all of our eggs in one basket when we have Tappy <laughs> Dorks, because, you know, I but could... I was going to say, it's good that you didn't. I had the Beast Within in hand, and that would have been a nice target for it. I cast my Magus of the Future, and Tau uh, held priority here and engaged in a little bit of table talk with Gary. The, the exact quote that I wrote down is, how big of a threat do you think that is? And I wrote in parentheses, spoiler, it's a big threat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we played a game before the actual game we recorded, yeah, we, right? We and, we and so up, yeah. so the, the, the future side effects are pretty key at this point. I have a conflict of interest here, because I do ha still have the Phyrexian Metamorph in my hand. I could have Omegas of the Future myself if I don't counter it. So I wanted to hear what Garrett's thoughts were at the time. And in all honesty, I had the Beast Within, so if things got too too crazy, I have this this kind of like um, silver bullet in my pocket. And no one wound up countering it. it. It resolved, and so then I dropped the Boros Garrison, and then I bounced the Temple of Enlightenment back to my hand, which, you know, Scryland is particularly good with a future site on board because I know before I drop it what's on top and whether or not I want to, you know, put it to the bottom. So and I just, think at this point the revealed card was Time Stretch. I have a note about that. Right, yeah, that's... Uh, that's mm -hmm. Worthy of note. I didn't make note of it. I should have. Uh, I definitely, while I was playing the game, was acutely aware that Time Stretch was on top of my library. Yes, yeah. yes. So my turn five, uh, I top a Flooded Strand up, so that's my draw. Uh, I play the Lotus Veil, sacking two islands, um, and then I use the three mana from the Lotus Veil to, and uh, Phyrexian mana to play the Phyrexian Metamorph. I now have a Magus of the Future, um, and I untap my Lotus Veil and pass with just five mana up. I assumed you must have top-decked the Phyrexian Metamorph. I guess I was wrong about that. But just because you thought at all about countering the Magus of the Future, I mean, I guess I, guess I was thinking two different things at this point. I was thinking maybe the talk about a counter was just a bluff, or maybe you top-decked the Phyrexian Metamorph because if you were going to take the Magus of the Future for yourself, um, you know, why would you counter it? You want it on the board. For a minute, anyway. Asking Garrett the, pr the previous turn about countering it is just, uh, once something is on the board, I do not have a lot of ways to deal with it. Right. So when it's on the stack, it's kind of the only time that uh, I can prevent something from happening or prevent you from getting the benefit of something. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I think I was split 50-50 on countering it, but yeah, definitely uh, copying it was, uh, well... It, it paid dividends. It, it, <laughs> you basically stole my game plan from me, but I, I'm not bitter or anything. Was... I, I'm actually a little honored. I'm a little flattered. <laughs> so I pass with uh, five mana open, knowing that I have actually two counters to choose from, a Mystic Confluence and the Arcane Denial. Mm -hmm. At the end of your turn, actually, I Drown Yard, and I get a Reflecting Pool, another black source, uh, <laughs> a Massacre Worm, whatever, and then I got a Frantic Search in my graveyard. Well, it's funny um, you say whatever to the Massacre Worm, because to me, that was the only <laughs> thing I cared about. It's like, oh, Damn, there's a Masker Worm in his graveyard. If yeah. that comes back out, it could be in some trouble. Uh, turn five, I drew an Internal Witness. And at this point now, I have a strict game plan. Get to seven lands. Have two black sources. Because I can Internal Witness back the Frantic Search. Use the Frantic Search. It's a free discard two. Oh wait, I have two combo pieces in my hand. Which will leave four mana up. 
to cast the necrotic ooze and win the game. So strong. I have I have this game plan in my hand now, exactly know what I want to do. Okay. I played a forest and passed, and I knew that I still had um, some like a, a way to respond to the board. I had the beast within, and also my mana progress is looking better and better. You need how many man? How much so mana do you need? Seven mana to... is what I want to need to get to to win. Mm -hmm. So six mana the turn before I have the mana progress turn. Mm -hmm. Uh, which would be nice. I have a tangential question. Tao, do you run a, a frantic search in your deck? Uh, it was in a previous version. I think uh, this version does not have. Because if search. well, if you did, I was just going to say all three of us were running a frantic search, but I guess not. Not to be. Uh, <laughs> I'm not running a soul ring in my chromat deck, so I'm not sure. The probably the only card we're all three running was like an island. I don't run island. <laughs> you don't run island? No. <laughs> no? That's the only basic land I don't have. I have really? One, I have one swamp and two forests. Oh, jeez. Mm -hmm. Top? Do you run Sensei Divining Top? No, you don't. Town, I had that. <laughs> yeah. uh, no time spiral for you? No, you I, 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 I'm going to put it in, though. <laughs> oh, well, okay. No, not time spiral. I'm, I'm sorry. Windfall. Windfall, windfall, windfall I'm going to put in. It. Then we would all three have windfall, because yeah. I do run, I run windfall in <laughs> chromat deck. Yeah, yeah but, uh, but not currently. So Yeah, that's, that's funny that there's so much similarity between our decks. <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to go too deep down that rabbit hole there but so i drew the time stretch and i had the magus of the future in place so i revealed a sacred foundry on top of my library and i played that as my land for turn taking the shock on it revealing a temporal mastery on top of my library which is kind of kind of a that's like the one of the weirder cards to have revealed with a future sight type effect it's good to know that it's there but it's also not great to broadcast that it's there so it, also you never want to actually play it from the top you want to actually draw it and well hindsight, miracle it. hindsight 2020 i maybe should have tried to cast it from the top instead what i decided to do <laughs> was to cast a clever impersonator mm -hmm. um, so this is on the stack and tau and garrett have to you know solve this puzzle as to what my plan is with it and eventually you, you figured it out before uh garrett gets all the credit for that yeah. he figured it out uh, I even take you know, one of your tricks, Dan, and ask you what you're going to copy, and, and, and you, you I decline was, to answer. I, I said, I don't want to ruin the surprise. <laughs> right. And, um, I mean, I, I knew what he was doing, but I was also trying to get Tao to counter it, because the more counter spells Tao gets out of his hand, yeah. the better off I am, because I have this combo deck that just has one answer, one thing in my hand to that needs to get through. Yeah, my, my, my so. current Chromat build isn't a strictly combo deck, but it's combo-ish. Right. It has really huge spells that all but win the game for so we were in this kind of game of chicken, Garrett and I were, right. where we were trying to goad the mono blue player into <laughs> using their answers on the other one of us exactly. so that we would have a window, but... Uh, I won this battle. <laughs> well, well so, we, so Garrett figures out that Dan's plan is to copy my sensei's divining top yes. so that he can actually miracle the temple mastery um, either on one of our turns or, I guess, just float the Temporal Mastery on top of his deck until right. you're ready to use it. Right, and, and the other thing that comes from that is I basically get to turn my Clever Impersonator into something else then, because it mm -hmm. goes on top of my library, and then I redraw it and then recast it as anything else. So right. it's only a top temporarily. Mm -hmm. I had an answer to it in the Nephalia Drown Yard in play, but yeah. I still was just trying to get to, and I didn't, to see it. I didn't realize I didn't, that, I, so... I, I didn't realize it either, and I really should have realized that. You know, I, I was the one kind of banking on having a temporal mastery. Garrett convinces me to, to counter it. I mean, I feel good about countering it. And j just a, a quick thought went through my head that using Arcane Denial on your Clever Impersonator actually doesn't prevent you from miracle <laughs> temporal mastery the next oh, turn. That is true. That's so I was like, true. oh, I better use this Mystic Confluence. Right. So I uh, cast Mystic Confluence choosing to counter it unless you pay six. And also bouncing the Magus of the future back into your right. I, I had four mana available, right. potentially. I just think it's interesting that we're basically talking about two cards here. Clever Impersonator plus Mystic Confluence equals, like, probably literally <laughs> billions of possibilities just on the board, like right there, right. Um, as, as to how we could have played that. But I think I think you guys solved the puzzle pretty well. So anyway, uh, at that point, you, you also bounced the Magus of the Future to right. my hand, right, with Mystic Confluence. So, that, I mean, that was it for me. My turn was over, and I was pretty thoroughly dealt with. It, it, it set me behind uh, a, a statistically significant amount, <laughs> I would say. This game was wasn't really played on the on the board or with life totals it was played 
in our hands. And well, well, that's what happens when all three players are playing blue. <laughs> I mean, really. <laughs> Although your, your Garrett's deck isn't yeah. a super blue deck, but yeah. I just got it's a, in I, there. I got a weird draw with this game too. I wasn't. Yeah. I wasn't just like my engine never turned on. You're right. Um, you didn't really see it ever come to fruition. Yeah, you were you were about a turn yeah, or you two never, away from. Yeah. You never got a dredger into the graveyard. Exactly. Yeah. So my turn six, I draw a fabricate, and this draw is revealed to. Both Dan and Gary. Yeah, because you had the Magus of the Future, even though I didn't. I had anymore. the copy of the Magus. Right, of you the jerk! Future. You you copy my thing, then bounce mm-hmm. the thing that you copy. <laughs> so basically, with the Fabricate in my hand, that is a theoretical clock on the board. It's not a an attacking clock. I'm going to kill you, but as soon as I get up to a certain amount of mana, uh, I can fabricate for the Chain Veil and yeah. win right there. So on turn six, I play an island that was revealed from the top of my library. I use Lotus Veil and untap it with my Voyaging Seder copy to cast my commander to Fairy. And I wrote, it begins. One of the cards that was re- I knew that was on top of my library was uh, Propaganda, which is very useless in this particular matchup because no one is really attacking me. No. So I plus one to Fairy and put a Windfall into my hand, which I had no intention of really casting, but putting the Propaganda on top. It's kind and of a con- contingency plan. Yeah. Know. On top of my library, I revealed a Torpor Orb, which actually, at first in my head was, oh great, another kind of useless card for this matchup, because I thought of Garrett as a dredging deck, and Dan, you have lots of untappers, there's not a lot of enters the battlefield effects. Yeah. So it was <laughs> it was on top of my library, and I was thinking about, like, should I like, shuffle it away or something like that, but I, I passed my turn at this point. I do have mana up for Arcane Denial. Well, we actually saw the Torp Orb, too. Yeah. Yes. And, the, and, and I was like, ah, useless card. I was like, oh, I'm Graveyard. Like, I, I, I really tried to push the fact that you were, um, you didn't want it in play because my entire game plan at this point was this Eternal Witness. Right. <laughs> and I needed the edge of the battlefield. So you were trying to bluff yes. Tau into a false sense of, I don't really need a, a Topol Orb. Yeah, exactly. Tor- tor- torpor, torpor, or... torpor. <laughs> the card is portal orb, portal yeah. orb. Yeah, the card is miserable. Torpedor. Yeah, it's uh, like, that's one of the, like the most. I don't want to have friends anymore. Cards in Magic. If you think about it, EDH is based around enter the battlefield effects. Largely, yeah. You, you want to get immediate value. Yeah. And at this point, I saw the the torpor orb, um, but I I knew I had the I had an answer to it, so I could you know get rid of it with the beast within. So during Tau's end step, Garrett used his Nephalia Drownyard, which I should have yeah. noticed was there, and I I would like to think that if I wasn't taking notes, I would like. <laughs> it's kind of we're, we're juggling a hundred things at once, but that's no excuse. Mm-hmm. I should have noticed. I didn't. You milled me three, and I lost a temporal master that I was kind of banking on, regardless. Right, but I, I feel like at this this whole point, um, I was tr- really trying to make you guys look at each other. I was trying to play you, Dan. Like you always kind of play that political. I'm the, yeah. the background, not doing anything. If you're trying to play me against Tau, why wouldn't you let me cast it? Right, give me the extra turn, make me seem really scary, make Tau counter it. Right. Right, but then I would no, may have you're, lost. You're, so you're, <laughs> yeah, you're 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 absolutely right. It was the correct play. I was the idiot. I'm just trying to de- deflect yeah. attention from my mistake. So I drew a Yamavaya Coast. Uh, I played it. I still need a black source. What turn is this? This is turn six. Yeah. I, I, I played six lands at this point, yeah. um, and I still don't have a black source. And I pass my turn. On my turn six, I drew a Temple of Plenty, and I, I had a choice to make. I could either tutor with the Dark Petition to grab a Zuza and drop three lands on the turn, or I could just recast Magus of the Future and see what that did for me. Um, I ultimately decided to go the tutor Azusa route. I cast Azusa, she resolved. I dropped a Scry land. I looked at a burgeoning on top of my library. So then I played another Scry land. I saw a Demonic Tutor, and that I did leave on top. Um, and then I played a Bloodstained Mire as my third land for turn, and I had to remember not to crack the Bloodstained Mire, because then we would lose the Demonic Tutor, and all would be lost. But uh, And I made a note here, if nothing changes, should have Time Stretch mana available next turn, I need to play around Counterspell. I wrote, I need to play around <laughs> Counterspells, uh, and that I was watching Tau's mana very carefully. I had, I had to figure out whether or not I believed that Tau had... Uh, an answer to the time stretch. At this point, too, you had scribed to the top, and I still had the Nephalia Drownyard. 
So I was like, should I use it on Dan or should I use it on myself? Because I, I, at this point, I knew I wanted more cards in my graveyard. I, right. like, I really wasn't doing anything. Yes. I wanted a dredger. There are a bunch in there. I, I wanted to increase my chances of hitting one. So, I, But I, I did write, make a note, should I uh, mill Dan here? I, I was well aware that it was a possibility. But without the Magus of the Future in play, you didn't know what exactly. it was on top. You just knew that I had kept it on top. Uh and that being said, it wouldn't have been as devastating as losing the extra turn. You know, exactly. I mean, Demonic Tutor is a great card. Don't get me wrong, but my turn seven, this was a big turn. So uh, I top and I put a Thran Dynamo um, on top of my library. I draw that. I cast Thran Dynamo. Then I use the mana from Thran Dynamo to play a Relic of Progenitus from the top of my deck. I used mana from Lotus Veil vale to cast a Vesuvian Doppelganger copying Azusa. You jerk. So basically at this point I've copied every single creature that Dan that you've played this game. And the whole idea of my deck is to get a future side effect and an Azusa effect online at the same time so that I can just play land from the top, land from the top, spell from the top, land from the top, spell from the top, spell from the top. And instead you're doing it. <laughs> it's great. Who knew you can do this it's, in mono it, blue? It's a really great, yeah, it's a great uh, sort of synergy there. I'm really happy for you. I'm glad you got to experience it. And, yeah. <laughs> so I play an island from the top of my library. I play a flooded strand, I think, from my hand. At this point, I think I'm tapped out, and so I to uh, use Teferi's minus one ability, uh, intending to untap the Thran Dynamo and the Lotus Veil vale and two islands and get eight mana. Ugh. And at this point, Garrett, I think you had a response. When you were went to go untap your lands, I knew uh, because you had the um, Relic of Progenitus in play, that's my entire game plan. Right. So, And, and at this point, I, I was convinced, absolutely convinced you weren't going to cast the Torpor Orb. It was on top. It kept staying on top. You just, like, you, you there was nothing, there was nothing there. So I was like, Beast within, uh, oh. beast within the uh, the relic of progenitus, and then I'm good. I'm golden. I win next turn. At this point, the only lands I have untapped are a flooded strand and a Boseju. Yeah. Right. Either Dan was going to force me to crack the flooded strand and shuffle away the torp orb. Yeah. Or potentially use my Boseju mana to crack the relic of progenitus and right. Boseju. Not having Boseju up leaves my arcane denial counterable yeah i mean well, not, which, it was not a huge concern like uh i know dan in like past revisions of your chromat deck you played some counter spells right and I've, i didn't I've, know how many you had left in i've cut them and maybe i will change that <laughs> <laughs> when garrett targeted the relic with the beast within i figured well i could actually crack it now and i would get kind of an inconsequential part of garrett's graveyard mm-hmm. so or I could just let him destroy it, and at some point I could probably try to find uh, an academy ruins or a buried ruin to get the relic back. Yeah. Like once you use relic to uh, exile all the graveyards, that's it. The relic is exiled as well, and so like I don't get a second shot at it. So I figured actually letting the beast within resolve was better in this case. That was my response, and then you got your eight mana up, right? I got my eight mana up. I think I topped again, and you know what? I would have shuffled away the torpor orb. If I didn't see a Tezzeret the Seeker right underneath it. <laughs> and Tezzeret the Seeker gets me kind of a missing piece. It gets me another mana rock that I need to get up to the amount of mana that, you know... Uh, would be necessary. Would be necessary off, yeah. for Chain Veil and Teferi to, to go infinite. <laughs> so I ended up just playing the Torp Orb anyway. Who knows what effect it might have. Play the Tezzeret. Play an Urborg off the top of my library, so... Which is Garrett's first Pump black source. <laughs> so second, second black source, thank you very much. But oh, right. I, I needed it for the Necrotic Ooze, right. I needed it for... Like, now, now, but he played the, the Torbor, but I'm like, oh my god. I use ter- Tezzeret's min- uh, minus one, or it's a minus X, but I minus one to get a Mana Vault. I have the game next turn if nothing goes wrong. Well, it's kind of incredible. At the time, the game didn't feel this close. Uh, at least not from my perspective. It really was not from a board state sort of perspective, but like Tal was saying, you know, from a cerebral sort of point of view, we were mm-hmm. all closer than anyone else right. realized mm-hmm. to, you know, potentially winning the game. I had no idea how close Garrett was. He looked like he had a terrible draw. Yeah, and Garrett, Garrett looked like he was way behind. Yeah, I, I didn't think he was mm-hmm. much of a threat. Yeah. 
Exactly, but but I was also playing that that role too. I, yeah, I yeah. the funny thing is, you know that that infinite um, randomness of your deck. Uh, the land you're, that, talk, you're talking about my my theory that yes, exactly. cards exist in a state of superposition when it, not observed. Exactly. Quantum mechanics of my, my I'm, I'm totally serious. I can go deeper into why I believe that too. I think that the entire universe is a simulation. I think we're living inside of a computer, and algorithmically, it's more like CPU efficient to leave the uh, the, the the code in kind of a state of undetermined superposition until it needs to be observed by these nodes of consciousness that are human beings. At this point, though, mine just has a really, really like bad joke in it because um, I draw my Uruborg. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's my next draw, Uruborg. I, I, I obviously play my Uruborg as well. Um, <laughs> it doesn't really. It's not really consequential. I know, I know, but like I, I, I've not been able to play a black card this entire any any of the black cards in my deck the entire game and then, until my turn seven when I'm going to win now. If the Torpor Orb wasn't in play. Stupid, so, <laughs> stupid Topal Orb. Oh, God. Torpal Orb. Yeah, whatever. Torpal Orb. Um, I played my Liliana, finally. Um, at this point, my Bane of Progress is useless because Torpor Orb again. So I, I just have a bunch of useless cards in my hand. So my game plan is ruined. I uh, played the Liliana, made a solid discard, and I passed my turn. I discarded my Magus of the Future, which left me with a time stretch and a time spiral in my hand. If I'm going to be left with a two-card hand, that's pretty much the two-card <laughs> hand that I want. On my turn seven, I drew the Demonic Tutor that Garrett did not, Nefalia Drown Yard, away. Um, and I, I, I did not think that Tau was sitting on a counterspell. Like I said last turn, I knew I needed to you know pay close attention to his mana, how many cards were in his hand. You had, what, two cards in hand now? Three cards in hand I had two now? cards in hand. You had two cards in hand, and only one blue untapped. I mean, you had a fetch land that you would have needed to crack to get a second blue, I think. In the intro, didn't you mention you only run like three counterspells in the deck? Yeah, they're like five. Okay, like five. So I... I was thinking that you probably didn't have one. I went ahead and I just cast Time Stretch, and I walked right into your Arcane Denial. Just <laughs> And at the time, I didn't think it was all bad, because I got to draw during your upkeep a Sensei's Divining Top and a Privileged Position. But, uh... How'd your turn go, Tao? How, how was your <laughs> turn eight? Well, I fabricated for the Chain Veil, and... I won the game. Yeah. <laughs> How about that? And now that I'm thinking about it, I'm a little mad at you for firing off the uh, Beast Within on his Relic of Progenitus. Well, I was so going to win the next turn. Oh, that, I guess that's right. Yeah, <laughs> if you didn't cast his Total Orb. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I had to. I guess that made sense. I'm still mad at you about it. Whatever. <laughs> Just to be specific about it, the Chain Veil into Fairy with Lotus Veil, Mana Vault, and Thran Dynamo nets me mana and Planeswalker activations so that I can constantly kind of empty Teferi of loyalty to gain mana and uh, and Planeswalker activations. That eventually lets me use his plus ability to go through my entire deck. I can grab Jace the Mind Sculptor and ultimate him to make you guys exile your libraries and your hands. Yeah. Uh, I can ultimate him twice, or I can just get Ugin and I mean, at the, Ghostfire. At this point, yeah. if your opponents haven't scooped, I don't know. They're not doing it quite right. <laughs> if they're making you go through all that. You, you actually do have to like recast Teferi a few times to make the combo work. You need a critical mass of artifact. Yes, but it doesn't really matter which ones they are. Yeah, and it's a combo that only works if Teferi is your commander, because if he's just in the 99, you can't recast him that Right, easily. okay, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that my lesson is I, I might want to run a little more interaction in Chromat. I, I don't know if I want to cut lands to do it. I probably can. I am... You know, 47's a lot. Well, I know, but, it, but that's kind of by design. That's the whole idea behind the deck, right? right. We're trying to do Hidden Commander, Azusa, build a big advantage. But I, I, I could probably cut a few of those I for mean, a few more instant speed answers to just sandbag and wait for a critical moment to, you know, destroy your Chain Veil, for example, would be a good way to do it. I think I mentioned, or we talked about it already, that it's a very, it was a very cerebral game. It yeah. was kind of, it, the game was played with our hands, with the hidden information in our hands, rather than what exactly was on the board. Like, the life totals didn't really change from 40 that much. No one declared an attack. And Ever. You're right about yeah, that. No one declared an attack. And I feel like this is the type of game that sometimes, like, if I'm going to, like, one of our local stores, this is the type of game that's really kind of looked down upon what do you in mean some by that? EDH circles. What do you mean by that? It might seem like this is a very uninteractive game. All of us are just trying to get to our combos yeah. as fast as possible. Not playing with each other, more just playing solitaire. But I, I think in discussing it, there was actually a lot of back and forth. It was just, it wasn't with cards on the board. It was like holding priority and talking mm -hmm. with the other opponent saying, right. you know, 
Should I do something? Yes, no. Blink if I should. No, I'm bummed I didn't get to cast Possibility Storm in this game. You know, that's <laughs> that, that doubles the amount of card images I have to source from Gatherer and the time, you know. Uh, part of me was glad that someone just ended it. <laughs> After editing last week's. If you haven't listened to last week's, you should listen to last week's. Well, that was, was a wild was, game. Uh, it was I wasn't wild. involved in it, but that was a wild game. And, and that's what happens when you run the sort the sort of deck that results in the sort of game that people don't frown upon. That was a very interactive <laughs> game. I kept disrupting their combos and making sure the game kept going. Uh, and it did. Oh, it did. We're all going to GP uh, Washington, D.C. Oh, that's true. So we will be at GP D.C. And uh, we're all in the... Com we're not playing the main event. No. We're, we're all taking the commander registration. Yes, we are. And we're going to be playing a lot of Commander. If anybody wants to play against us, too, I'm, I'm, I know we're all open to... Yeah, um, hit, us up on, games. hit us up on Twitter. Our Twitter handles are in the description. Um, and, yeah, if you're going to be at GPTC, let us know. Well, we, we, we'd love to meet you, reach out and touch you, and cast degenerate spells to make sure you lose games of magic against us. As a closing word, I just noticed I misspelled Lotus Veil, vale, Lotus Value, in all of my notes. <laughs> that's a... That's a... <laughs> Bit of a Freudian slip, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a weird misspelling. <laughs>